and welcome to today's Healthy Marriage. I'm your host Charlene Lammers, Executive Director for Great Marriages for Sheboygan County. Today I'd like to welcome our guest Sarah McQueen. She's the Program and Resource Library Coordinator for Great Marriages. Our topic for today is reality and resources. The reality comes from an announcement, a wedding announcement, in the New York Times on a Sunday that spoke about two, couple, uh, two couples who had divorced and then the couple had remarried. A follow-up article appeared on December 17th in the New York Times explaining the details of their romance. And then a follow-up segment on the morning show today. The Today Show. The Today Show came about and that's how we became aware of the story. So we went and followed up, dug into it a little bit more, and we thought that it would be a great topic to talk about the reality of weddings and marriages and falling in love because we see a lot of reality in our office every day. So Sarah, would you care to summarize you know, how that all came to be? Just give a little more detail about the couple and why we're talking about it today, perhaps. Sure. Um, well, the, the section that the story first showed up in was the vows section, which typically um, will tell a story of a couple who recently got married and just kind of explain how they met and their romance and getting married. And this couple um, met because they had kids in the same school. And so they met through just different functions with the school. And eventually they decided that they had fell in love with each other. And that... Um, and both were married and had both children. Both were married and had small kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the families actually became close friends from what it sounds like. I mean, they took family vacations together. They, um, you know, as families, they were, they were close with each other. And... That's kind of how they explained that they fell in love because they spent all this time with each other. So they decided that the only thing they could do was to leave their respective families and get married. Um, and so the story, when it first showed up in the New York Times, actually got a lot of really negative feedback. Um, because the story didn't mention anything about these, the, their ex-husband and wife um, or the kids who were affected by this. And, and a lot of people really felt like it was actually kind of insensitive to, to show this story um, without really showing how it actually affected, really devastated two families. So then another story was written and then it eventually, you know, I think probably in a lot of morning shows or different talk shows that kind of got picked up because it was just this really kind of controversial story and what's usually a section that's happy and you know all about happy healthy romances and this one was pretty different from what they normally sure because show. you read that section of the newspaper the vows section you know who got married and you think oh happily ever after this is wonderful mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> well in this case then you know two families were destroyed to for this marriage exactly. to occur. Mm -hmm. So then what, what are the ramifications? I think, wasn't the article on the 17th titled Two Divorces, One Scandal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty controversial. <laughs> right. And, and so then I think one of the quotes in the article was the bride saying, we've had a lot of people say to us how brave we are to do this. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Well, I think, um, you know, this is a, a culture that's very about instant gratification. And so I think people like to find justification for why it's okay to um, kind of act on their emotions and their impulses. And so I think they felt like, oh, well, if this other couple did it and they could leave their marriage and go with someone who really made them happy, then it would be okay for me to. So that was some of the kind of positive feedback that they got. But a lot of the, um, a lot, the majority of the comments were really, uh, I think that was positive to read those comments because there are people out there who really felt like, you know, they had made commitments and in their first marriages and it was really selfish of them, people felt like, to just 
kind of ditch that. And um, you know, people said it, they sounded like they were sort of impulsive teenagers, mm -hmm. um, but really they were both you know, in their 40s and had been married and had kids and yet they were acting like kind of more teenagers. Right, it, the, a lot of people accuse the New York Times by running that story kind of telling the story of how they fell in love and why it was a good thing, but that it was celebrating the disillusionment of two marriages mm -hmm. and, and you know, dissolving the family structure. Mm -hmm. Two families were sacrificed for the sake of these two people and their happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly didn't paint the whole picture mm -hmm. of everybody who was actually affected by, you know, by their decision. And, and in the story, you know, they, they kind of made it sound like they tried to do what they did honorably. So they, um, you know, in that story, they said that they didn't, they weren't unfaithful to their spouses at the time, and they chose to do something terrible as honorably as possible, um, which just doesn't really paint the whole picture because it, or, I mean, it shows that they didn't really uphold that first commitment and that first covenant they made in marriage. Um, so just because they weren't unfaithful well, their definition of unfaithful exactly. was they, they said they fell in love, and then when they realized they were in love with each other, they separated from their spouses. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after their divorces that they moved in together. Mm -hmm. So they were defining unfaithfulness with a sexual act. Right, just a physical act. But we know that unfaithfulness can be emotional, can be mental, can be physical. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that from the office, right? Mm -hmm. So their definition was only the physical portion, but mm -hmm. certainly unfaithfulness is defined in a much broader perspective because people, just by the act of falling in love with mm -hmm. another person and mentally being with them instead of your spouse, mm -hmm. or the emotional ties that you allow to occur with another person is, is a form of unfaithfulness. Absolutely. So we would, we would contradict that there was unfaithfulness. Mm -hmm prior to them moving in together. Mm -hmm. And then they lived together for a while before they were married, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I forget how long that was. Yeah, I don't know exactly how long, but I just, you know, the whole situation must have been extremely confusing and difficult for the kids also, and that wasn't anything that was mentioned or, or you know, addressed as to how that's actually affected them. I mean, the, the piece really, didn't do justice to everyone who is affected by a situation like this. And we see that effect, we see the ripple effect of how many lives are damaged and how many people are affected by acts such as this. Mm -hmm. We see that every day. Absolutely. And in, in some cases, didn't they actually, they get together, but then they broke up and went back to their families? Right. And then got back together and broke up. It did up. say that. Mm -hmm. The kind of bounce, I think it was the gentleman maybe, mm -hmm. specifically they said sort of bounce back and forth, back and forth because he was conflicted. and. And that's just so confusing for the kids, especially, and really unfair for them to have to go through that. You know, so how does this happen? Because they said they met at school, you mm -hmm. know, at their children's school, and they, they instantly had an attraction. Mm -hmm. And then they would look for each other at, at, you know, events for the kids and their family's vacation together and at holiday dinners together, and there was always this attraction. And they never really crossed a line until mm -hmm. one day, they met in a bar. I think the quote from the article was that he invited her out for a drink at a local watering hole. Mm -hmm. The first time that they had gotten together away from their spouses. Mm -hmm. And she knew something was up. So, you know, how we talk about that, how you can protect yourself from infidelity. Mm -hmm. And even though they might not have had the physical act of infidelity, there was definitely a form of infidelity that was occurring. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to protect ourselves from the temptation of infidelity is not to meet with a person of the opposite sex that we're attracted to, mm -hmm. you know, in a bar right. where alcohol is being served, mm -hmm. it puts ourselves in a predicament that probably doesn't lead to good things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keeping yourself out of situations that you think might be, you know, I think in the office we see, uh, or we've heard a lot of stories, or we've talked to different, um, you know, businesses that have seen. Uh, yes. workplace affairs that have been really detrimental to, you know, their organizations and their productivity. And I think it's, you know, it's easy. It can be easy if you're in close proximity with someone. Um, and so the best thing is if you sense that happening to just stop it from the beginning. Don't put yourself in those situations where, you know, that could be 
it could lead to something else. And because temptation and, and physical attraction to the opposite sex is, is always going to maybe occur. Mm -hmm. To some extent, that happens. It's, mm -hmm. it's natural, it will happen. Mm -hmm. But do we act on that? And what choices do we make? And you know, do we allow ourselves to get caught up in that and take it to the next level? Or do we stop and, and not put ourselves in the position where something could continue and right. you know, further the, the relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, um, at one point in the article also, they said, one of the quotes was from the person writing the article, that they commended the couple for handling this situation with honesty and openness. Mm. You know, saying that they separated and they, you know, got divorced before they got married. And, and you know, they're talking about the honesty and how they felt it was being honest mm -hmm. to admit that they were in love. And it would have been a lie to stay with their spouses who they were not attracted to or in love with anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, what you know, what do we talk, talk about with that regarding the honesty? What is the actual honesty there? You know, the honesty maybe to our spouses mm -hmm. to say, honey, you know, I'm not... I'm feeling this attraction towards someone else and I think our relationship is in a bad place and we need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe that type of honesty rather than saying, I don't love you anymore and I'm attracted to this person so I'm just going to leave you, dump you on around Christmas and then go um, meet up with this person. Right. Well, and, and all the research kind of shows that, you know, what they were or are feeling for each other is probably fleeting. and. So they've kind of acted on this, what they say is love, but is probably more about kind of lust and that physical attraction. And that's not something that really necessarily lasts through a marriage because there, you know, there are different stages and it goes through different mm -hmm. phases. And so they've really kind of, it seems like made an impulsive decision based on something that might not last. And I mean, there are certainly, you know, second and third marriages that are very successful and really healthy, but the research actually shows that, um, you know, a, a much higher percentage of second marriages end in divorce and then an even higher percentage of third marriages end in divorce. So really the, the odds are kind of stacked against them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we know there are seven stages and what you were referencing was the first stage of passion. Mm -hmm. Point where I'm in love, everything's wonderful, you're perfect, we're the perfect for each other, we're each other's soulmate. Mm -hmm. Do we not combat that idea, that notion of soulmate? Absolutely. All the time. Mm -hmm. Find that one perfect person who will make me happy forever. And oh, if I don't like you or we're arguing, then you're not my soulmate and I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. So I have to go find that one perfect person. Mm -hmm. But w what is real marriage? Is it, you know, is it finding your soulmate and being happy forever? Not really. Reality is finding someone you love, getting married, and then choosing to make it work. Absolutely. Finding a way to make it work. Yeah. And we know that that is the way that lasting marriages happen. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they look back and they'll, 50 years of marriage, they say, hmm, there are probably five years that weren't very good. Mm -hmm. We struggled. And in the middle of those five years of struggling, we thought it was going to be that way forever. And I just want the pain to end. And I just want to stop. And I want to be in love. And if we would have got out of it at that point, we would have never went on mm -hmm. to the best that was yet to come. So looking back at 50 years, oh, there are 45 good years, mm -hmm. many, many more good years. But we mm -hmm. would not have had them if we gave up during those times. Absolutely. So what you're referencing, I believe, is that passion mm -hmm. stage, which is, you know, the wonderful stage. Mm -hmm. Well, then what comes next? Well, and the next stage is the rebellion stage. Realization. Realization stage. And then rebellion. Right, where you start to actually realize what are the, what does it mean to live with this person? What are the ins and outs of the daily life? And that's difficult sometimes, and it takes a lot of adjustment, and mm -hmm. um, people aren't always prepared for that because and I think we see this in the office a lot. We're kind of combating this idea of finding your soulmate and that there is one person out there who can complete you and make you happy. And that's really unrealistic. And when people enter into marriage with that idea, they have really high expectations for their spouse. And they're setting themselves up for disappointment because there's no way that one person can do everything for you and make you happy and kind of complete you um, it's, you know, each person has to be happy, on, you know, they need to be able to be healthy in a relationship and not expect someone else to do everything for them. And so this idea of, well, I'm in this marriage now and this person's not doing something for me, so I'm going to find someone else who can, who can do that for me. Well, five, seven years down the road, they're probably going to hit that same point. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden feel like, oh, wait, well, this person's not 
doing something for me or they're not completing me. So maybe they're not the right person. And you can just see how the cycle continues and why second marriages and third marriages and have even higher you know, percentages of, of ending in divorce. And we know that second, third marriages go through the seven stages faster. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first stage being that passion, I'm in love, everything's great. Second stage, realization. Mm -hmm. I'm learning that you're not perfect. I'm mm -hmm. forgetting that I'm not perfect also, mm -hmm. but I'm learning what your imperfections are. And the third stage, to rebel against them, mm -hmm. to openly feel like maybe I made a choice, to argue a lot, to um, have a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a negative stage. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people struggle through that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so then the second, third marriages, you get to that stage even faster. Mm -hmm. So it, it is hard. So, okay, so this couple reaches that stage, not a great stage, and they find somebody that they're passionate with and they, they can be in love with, and they're, mm -hmm. they're feeling all the good feelings of the passion stage. So divorce, get married to the new one, mm -hmm. or in the passion stage. You know, this couple that we're referencing has only been married, what, a year and a half, mm -hmm. or something? Yeah, Less than a couple of years. Not long. So what happens when they get to the rebellion stage? Mm -hmm. Then what? You know, where are we going to be and, and how are those families going to be affected? Mm -hmm. And then what are we going to think about all of this from a different, you know, a new perspective of looking back and seeing what, what we've been through mm -hmm. and where we are today. Exactly. Yeah. We're kind of fighting against this culture of, you know, instant gratification where if I'm not happy right now, I'm going to figure out how, how I can be happy. And that really you know, the, what we're referencing, the seven stages of marriage, that there's a book called The Seven Stages of Marriage. Yes, and it's and I think based, we have it. Right? It's, yep, yeah, it's based on um, a survey, a hu you know, this huge survey done of married couples. And mm -hmm. um, research in it also shows that um, couples who would describe themselves as miserable, I mean, they're just in the thick of it, fighting, really having a tough time. Well, couples who stay together, even when the, that's where they are right now, you know, five years later, 80% of those couples, 86% of those mm -hmm. couples say that they're happy, that they're in a completely different place than they were five years ago. But when you're in it, it's so hard to, to see that, but it's really worth it to be able to figure out how to get through it together as a couple. And your marriage is, is just that much stronger, you know, when you're on the other side of it. Exactly, and they talk about pendulum, you know, how far you swing this way mm -hmm. in a negative place in your marriage, you come back on the other side to mm -hmm. a positive place. So when you are in that bad place, you make it through, it strengthens you. Mm -hmm. You know, you are in a much stronger place because you know that you've been through some challenging times, you made it, you have that bond, and you have the knowledge that you can make it through almost anything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you, we've also, we brought with us some resources. You know, we referenced the seven stages of marriage. Um, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the title of the show today is Reality and Resources. Mm -hmm. So what happens when reality sets in? Where do we go for help? Mm -hmm. You know, we suggest you can come to us, obviously. You can go to your pastor. Mm -hmm. Go to friends or family members who are making it, who have a successful marriage of 20 years or more mm -hmm. and, and are making it. Mm -hmm. Do not go to people who are in bad relationships or are in the middle of a divorce, have been in a, in a bad place because mm -hmm. they're probably not going to give you wise counsel. Mm -hmm. you know, go to someone who has the experience to make it through. Absolutely. You know, I think, um, I think it, it's starting to be more accepted to kind of look for support mm -hmm. um, or ask for help if you're struggling. You know, I think it used to be um, people had a really hard time talking about it because they felt like it was so private. And, you know, I think you think you're the only one going through it. And we hear that a lot. Oh, we do. Um, you know, people don't really want to talk to their friends and family because they're kind of embarrassed. Um, but the reality is everyone has gone through it. You know, it might look different for different couples, um, but especially those couples who have been married for 20, 30, 40 years, you can guarantee that they've had tough months and years probably, and that they really have a lot of wisdom to probably share with people. Um, so I think part of it is just letting people know that it's normal to hit those rough patches and it's, you know, it's recommended to, to get some help and to talk to people who can support you through that. So what, let's talk for a moment about what, how do we stay in a marriage when we're unhappy? Why should we? Why should we stay in a marriage when we're unhappy? Um, well, I mean, I think what, you know, what we mentioned before that uh, statistics really show that if you can get through it together, you know, you're going to be 
probably happier than you were before, than you could even imagine. You know, you really mm -hmm. have learned how to get through these tough times together. And so the trust and respect is going to be even higher than it was before. Um, and the, the, the chances are that you would, the chances that you would get a divorce and marry again and that that would be successful and that would be really what you're looking for are really slim. I mean, it's counterintuitive. It's not that you learned the first time around are gonna do it better the second time. It's the reverse. It's gonna be even harder. And so if you can just stick it out and figure out how to get some support, um, you know, your marriage is gonna be so much stronger. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a misconception that it's better for the kids to not see um, parents fighting and that if I'm in an, an unhappy marriage, it's gonna be better for the kids to get to get out of that unhappy marriage and get in a situation that's better for me. And the research really shows that the opposite is true, um, that kids do better when there are two parents in the household. And that, I mean, fighting is normal. So it's not a terrible thing for kids to see parents fighting when they see them doing it in a healthy way or, you know, mm -hmm. making up. I mean, that's, that's exactly good. What, what we've learned and what we've seen as reference that you made to the research is that when children see their parents have difficulties and argue, they also see that their parents stick it out. Mm -hmm. they, you're giving them the example that you can have tough times, you can make it through, mm -hmm. and things can be good again. You teach them that you argue, but you make up. Mm -hmm. You know, you apologize. You go on and you continue to love someone. That's the security of a marriage that lasts a lifetime. That is the best gift that we can give to our children. Mm -hmm. We have moms come in all the time or, or people in general, but specifically moms sometimes, they'll say, well, my children are my priority because they're young and they need me. Mm -hmm. But your spouse needs you and your children need you to have a healthy marriage mm -hmm. because the best gift that we can give our children is a secure family environment with a mom and a dad. Mm -hmm. you know, and all of the research shows that to be the case, mm -hmm. that that is, is healthy for children to grow up with a mom and dad in a place. Mm -hmm. So you know, if we make our spouses our priority, then mm -hmm. we are doing what's best for our children because we're protecting our marriage. Mm -hmm. it, it's a gift that we can give them and, and they will learn from our example about what a relationship is and a healthy one and how to make it work or not work. Mm -hmm. and, and we teach that divorce is generational. So it increases your chance for divorce if, you, if your parents are divorced. Mm -hmm. You know, the more divorce you see, the more you realize that that is an option and, and the more likely you are to use that option. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to really find ways to keep that marriage healthy and strong mm -hmm. and to give that example to the kids. Because if, if we raise our kids properly and we do the right things, they're going to grow up and they're going to leave us one day. Mm -hmm. They're going to get married and have families of their own, and mm -hmm. then we're with our spouse. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we see the empty nesters come in and say, I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. I haven't focused on you for how long? I've focused on the kids. And now what do I do with you? I don't even know if I like you anymore. How mm -hmm. do we spend the rest of our life together? And, and you don't want that to happen. You want the empty nest years to be a time when you're looking forward to spending, spending time, time together mm -hmm. and doing fun things and, and going out and exploring new avenues together and finding new hobbies together. Mm -hmm. So for that to happen, you have to continue to make your marriage a priority even when the children are there. Find time to be alone. Find mm -hmm. time to do things. If you're in a rough place in your marriage, fix it. Mm -hmm. Go out and find ways to get help. Mm -hmm. there, there is help available. And we need to uh, maybe what the one billboard we have, you know, you have to lose the pride to find the love. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to put our pride on the shelf and, and make ourselves a little vulnerable to opening up and, and asking for help. Exactly. So let's talk about you know, some of the other resources that we have because we have a resource library and we have a lot of resources available for couples. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have resources for healthy dating relationship skills for singles, um, pre-marriage education, books for that to help you, you know, prepare for marriage. We mm -hmm. have marriage enrichment. We have books for when infidelity occurs or if you're having problems in marriage and money, just a wide variety. Mm -hmm. Books, DVDs, CDs. Let's talk about some. We have a whole, you know, slew here in mm -hmm. front of us. Of course, this is just a very small taste of what we have in the mm -hmm. office. But let's just pick up a couple and, you know, talk about them. So we reference the seven stages of marriage. Mm -hmm. That is good for helping people put in perspective where their relationship is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, what about love and respect? Um, that's probably one of the, you know, kind of top rated items in our library. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so critical because it, 
it really teaches couples the idea that um, kind of the different needs that men and women have in a relationship and that if we can understand that then we're better equipped to you know give our spouse what they need and to ask for what we need um, and it just kind of lays the foundation for really good communication and that's kind of what everything boils down to I mean 99.9% .9 of what we see in the office is is kind of communication issues and I think we have a book here too, um, Cracking the Communication Code, you know, or maybe we don't have that with us today, but that is obviously a book that references how strong the need for good communication is within the couple. Mm -hmm. We have a book for the first five years of marriage. Mm -hmm. why, why do we have one focusing on the first five years of marriage? Those can probably be some of the most challenging. <laughs> exactly. And people, I think that's the time where people really, um, you know, go into marriage not fully knowing what it is that they're getting into. And so they can be even more surprised when they hit those, you know, the realization and the rebellion stage. And so just giving people the information of, you know, what it's really like and the reality um, kind of prepares them better when they hit those, those stages. Just want to quick throw out a couple more. So how to avoid marrying a jerk or a jerkette. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this is talking about having realistic expectations for what relationships are and what defines healthy and what is not healthy. Because we see a lot of people, especially cohabitating couples, mm -hmm. living in a extremely unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps that leads to marriage. And, mm -hmm. and that's setting a very weak foundation for a marriage. Mm -hmm. So the success rate of those marriages is very small. Mm -hmm. And that book is great too because it really encourages you to look at yourself and look at maybe patterns that you've established and why you've established those. And I think the tendency is to really point the finger at other people. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to take accountability for ourselves. Exactly. You, before you mentioned the differences between men and women. Mm -hmm. We have books in our library, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, but we also have this set of four DVDs. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's four DVDs talking specifically on the differences between men and women. How do we stay married when we don't like each other? Mm -hmm. What does that all mean? Um, Mark Gunger, who is the speaker of this series, the Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage series, is coming live mm -hmm. to Sheboygan at the Stephanie Weil Center on February 19th. We're sponsoring that event because we know that it's a great event to get couples out. Absolutely. Laugh. They can laugh and have a great evening together and, mm -hmm. and focus on their marriage in a non-threatening, fun way. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a great event. I just want to quickly throw out some others because I think we're short on time. Divorce busting, mm -hmm. when your marriage is having problems. Fighting for your marriage, this is great. It outlines tools and ways that you can improve your marriage. Mm -hmm. Sex-starved marriage. We have books for when one person wants out, a mate wants out, but you want to try to save the marriage on your own. There are things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Your time-starved marriage. How many marriages are time-starved? The Five Love Languages, the Love Dare book from Fireproof, the movie, which is an excellent movie. Mm -hmm. We have a number of DVDs, 10 Great Dates to Energize Your Marriage, Before You Say I Do, for Empty Nesters. There's something for all stages of marriage in our library, you know, from one year to 35, 40, 50 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can do to improve your marriage. Absolutely. I just want to thank you so much, you know, for being our guest today. I know that we have many more resources and we could probably talk for another hour on this mm -hmm. at least or more. <laughs> well, we'll have to stop for today. So, you know, I want to thank Sarah for being on the show today, for joining us in Healthy Marriage. I want to thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll come back and, and see our next program. Remember that marriage, it does matter. You can go to our website or come to our office to get some of these resources. Also, if you have questions that you would like us to address, send them to Great Marriages and we'll answer them on the next shows. Thanks so much.